Hello and welcome to episode three of the Kangaroo English podcast, a podcast about language for people learning languages. In this episode, I'm going to talk about human memory, how it works, and what that tells us about the best way to really remember things when we're trying to learn a language. Before we start, I just want to mention that this podcast and all of my other online activities, such as my YouTube channel and Facebook group, are all possible because of your very generous support. So, if you would like to sponsor free English education, there are two ways you can do that. The first way is you can become my patron on Patreon. And the second way is you can buy some incredible, stylish Kangaroo English merchandise. The links for both of those things are on my website at kangarooenglish.com. To start today, I want to give you a test. What I want you to do is to remember five words. World, country, America, Europe, Africa. Now, just take a moment to think about how likely it is that you can remember the five words on that list. Okay, now let me give you a second list of words. Flaunt, beseech, venerable, schism, ebullient. Now, just take another moment to think about how likely it is that you can remember the words on that list. Now, I think you'll agree that the first list is much easier to remember. But why is that? Because both of the lists contained five words. They contained exactly the same number of syllables. The words were the same length and they took approximately the same amount of time to pronounce. So, why would the words on the first list be so much easier to remember if they contained the same amount of information? There are two reasons. The first reason is that the words on the first list were in the same category. They were words related to geography. And the second reason is that the words on the first list were much more common So they are words that you probably already know. This tells us something really interesting about human memory and the way it works. It tells us that it's not the quantity of information, but the quality of that information. And it shows us that our memory has very specific limits. In 1956, the cognitive psychologist George A. Miller published one of the most famous papers in psychology called The Magical Number 7, Plus or Minus 2. In this paper, he suggested that the maximum number of objects that people can hold in their working memory is exactly 7, plus or minus 2. Now, That's incredible, right? That there is this specific number of objects that we can hold in our memory. But wait a minute. What exactly are these seven objects that we can hold in our memory? Because obviously we can't memorize seven books. Are the objects sentences or words or sounds or letters? To understand this question, we need to understand chunks. When we try to memorize something, our brain breaks it into chunks or pieces of information. Now, let's go back and think about that first list of words that I gave you. Now, all of the words on that list were very common. So... The meanings of the words and the sound of the words and the spelling of the words. You already had that information stored in your long-term memory. So, all you needed to remember 
were the words. You had five chunks, five pieces of information to remember. But the second list contained much more uncommon words. So you had to remember the syllables, the sounds, the pronunciations, possible spellings and possible meanings. There were a lot more pieces of information to remember, a lot more chunks. And that's why the second list is so much more difficult to memorize. Now, maybe that all seems very obvious and elementary, and you're thinking, Christian, why are you telling me this? But just stop for a moment and think about the consequences that this has on your language learning. What I'm telling you is, if you try to learn too many chunks at once, then you are scientifically guaranteed to forget it. If your learning strategy is sitting down in front of a five-page list of vocabulary and trying to memorize it, it's not going to work. It's much better for you to adapt your learning strategy and attack the problem in smaller pieces. And now I'm going to show you something else about your memory that's going to blow your mind. I'm going to give you another list of five words to memorize. And these are five very common words, and they are also in the same category. But we're going to do something a little bit different. When I'm reading the words to you, I want you to make this sound with your mouth. Th, 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 th. Just keep repeating that sound when I am reading you the list. Here we go. Mountain, river, forest, field, farm. Okay, you can stop now. So, how many of those words can you remember? For most people, it's really, really difficult to remember those five very common words. And the reason is something called the phonological loop. When I ask you to memorize something, you subconsciously do something that you don't even realize you're doing. You physically rehearse or practice the words in your mouth. Your mouth moves, it repeats the words, and you don't even realize that you're doing it. And when you interrupt this process by repeating the th, 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 when you stop yourself from being able to repeat the word in your mouth, then this interrupts your ability to remember it. It tells us that the physical aspect of memorization is really, really important. If you really want to remember vocabulary, then it's really important that you repeat it back. And this has been scientifically proven by asking people who are paralyzed to remember words. And people who are paralyzed, who are not able to move their mouths, are not as good at remembering vocabulary as people who are not paralyzed. It's absolutely fascinating. So something very important for you to incorporate in your vocabulary memorization process. But the question is, is it even necessary to try to memorize vocabulary at all? And I want to tell you about one final experiment that I think, again, will blow your mind. So, in 1978, some researchers gave a group of university students the book A Clockwork Orange. And they told them that after they finished reading the book, they would have an exam of literary criticism. An exam to see how well they comprehended the meaning of the text. This book was written by Anthony Burgess, who was also a linguist. And 
In the book, the main characters speak in their own special language called Nadsat. But a majority of these Nadsat words are actually just slightly modified Russian words. So, for example, in the book, you can find words like Bitva, which means battle, and Igra, which means game. And what the researchers wanted to know was how many of these Russian words would the students learn simply by context. So, when they finished reading the book, they gave them an exam of 90 Russian words. And the results were incredible. They discovered that, on average, each student learnt 68.4 words, or 75% of the Russian words that they tested them on. They learnt Russian vocabulary simply from context. So this is a good thing and a bad thing for learners. It shows that it is absolutely possible to learn vocabulary only from context, but you need to have sufficient vocabulary to understand the context. But it definitely proves that reading is an excellent way to learn new vocabulary, and all of the research has shown that the amount you read correlates directly with the size of your vocabulary. So what conclusions can we make about how to really memorize things when we're learning a language? Well, the first thing is that we should always try to remember vocabulary using context and association because that seems to really activate our subconscious memorization process. The next thing is that we need to really embrace the physical aspect of pronunciation by repeating and rehearsing the word physically. It, again, really helps us to remember it. And finally, we shouldn't try to remember too many things at once. We should try to break things into smaller chunks. Maybe exactly seven. In the conclusion to his paper, the magical number seven, George Miller wrote this. What about the magical number seven? What about the seven wonders of the world, the seven seas, the seven deadly sins, the seven daughters of Atlas in the Pleiades, the seven ages of man, the seven levels of hell, the seven primary colors, the seven notes of the musical scale, and the seven days of the week? What about the seven-point rating scale, the seven categories for absolute judgment, the seven objects in the span of attention, and the seven digits in the span of immediate memory? For the present, I propose to withhold judgment. Perhaps there is something deep and profound behind all these sevens, something just calling out for us to discover it. But I suspect that it is only a pernicious Pythagorean coincidence. I'm Christian. This is Kangaroo English. I'll see you in class.